All right, everybody, let's go ahead and get started. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're joining us from, and welcome to the newest in our CIDMS database management maintenance, excuse me, educational series with Dick Weiland. Um, before we get started, it looks like all of you are in the audio broadcast, so that being the case, if you have questions, please use the Q&A box right in the WebEx itself. Um, I think all of you are, are repeat visitors, so I'm not going to go through all the details of how to do that. Um, if you have any questions, do, do feel free to, to, to chime in there as well. Um, do it. When, and uh, with that, I'm just going to hand you right over to Dick because we, we have quite a bit to try to get through today, so take it away, Dick. Thanks, Len. Hi, everybody. Uh, good day. Uh, while I'm positioning our uh, material, uh, just want to let you know that uh, we do have a, a fair amount to go through today. Uh, depending on how much we get to, we may push this a little bit longer uh, than the uh, the typical hour. We'll have to see as we get near the top of the hour. We have made provisions, though, to add a, a, a seventh session, so uh, we'll uh, make that call as we get to the end of the Recover the Database section as to whether we push forward or whether we'll have another session next week uh, to finish up this material. So the recovering the database, I mean, our whole perspective on this material has been looking at maintenance tasks that the database administrator is going to be responsible for. And database recovery is one of those types of responsibilities. And we can break that, uh, that maintenance task down into basically two pieces, one backup and the second recovery. Now, the backup uh, of the database is something that is an ongoing maintenance activity. This is something that should be done on a regular basis, and it is the uh, process of producing copies of the database that can be later used in recovery operations. So it, it allows us to uh, get back lost data, whether that lost data is going to be a result of uh, improper processing, maybe adding the running with the transactions with the wrong data uh, or some type of a failure of programs or process, failure of the CV or some type of physical media. But that backup is what's going to allow us to create, if anything, a starting point for the recovery of that lost data. The recovery actually restores the contents of that database when some type of error does occur. And we're going to use the, these backup files, and also in an IDMS environment, you have something called journals, which are going to be used. So the backup is going to be something we're going to be doing on a regular basis, and recovery is something that is going to be performed on an as needed basis. It's also something that I, I think it's important to stress that you should do some type of practice exercises periodically within your environment so that you're familiar with the process and to make sure that all of the pieces of the recovery environment are in place. So the first thing to do is to design a general backup plan. Uh, you, you want to come through and as I said, make sure that you're dealing with not just, just the backup copies of the database, but also the, the data, the, the journal files that are going to be created within the IDMS environment. Uh, and, and how you're going to use those particular uh, backups and journal files are really going to depend on the, spe the specific scenario that you've encountered that has caused some type of a lost data. You may end up with, uh, like I said, bad, uh, bad data being uh, processed into the database. You have, might have some type of a physical failure. But the, the first thing is to define that backup and recovery environment while you're designing your applications so that you know where you're going to have some type of, of break points or recovery points to go to. And of course, this, this last point on here is test all your backup and recovery procedures before it goes into production. It's not a bad idea to periodically go through an exercise with that recovery. I know a lot of sites will uh, have some type of a disaster recovery 
uh, site. And during the, these DR drills, they will actually go through the recovery process to make sure that they have the pieces in place that are going to allow them to get the data back in, in a usable fashion. So the question becomes, when do I want to back up the database? Well, the first part, that, that first bullet is, I think, really the one that is going to uh, be the most commonly looked at, and that is at some type of regularly scheduled intervals. Now, that could be daily, weekly, uh, and, and then you want to make sure you know, or determine how long you're going to retain that information. So whether you're going to go with daily or weekly type backups is really going to depend on the nature of the database and the application that you're dealing with. If it's an application that uh, every evening may quiesce and nobody's going to be using it overnight hours, hey, it'd be great if you could back that thing up on a daily basis. If it's something that has to be up on a, a longer period of time, it's going to be accessed overnight, you may want to look at weekly types of backups. Uh, we will be talking in this section, again, uh, dealing with something called hot backups, uh, which is a special case that many sites have implemented with 24 by 7 databases. But right now, we're going to be talking about the, the structure of some type of a periodic non-hot non backup environment. So again, you want to make sure how long those, those backup files are going to be retained. Along with that retention, you're going to come through and make sure that you retain all of your journal files, your archive journal files, for that same period of time. And part of the reason for doing these frequent backups is going down to the last bullet on this slide. Uh, the frequent backups uh, will result in uh, reducing the amount of time required to recover the database. The reason that this will occur is because it's going to reduce the amount of journal information that you may have to process during a recovery operation. So again, look at those frequent backups. Some of the other points that, or, or uh, points within the process that you want to take backups, if we go back to that first major bullet, is before and after st structural changes to the database. We've been talking about this throughout the material. So before you expand the database or before you do a restructure on the database or some other type of process, you want to make sure that you uh, re back up the database before that procedure in case there's some error during the procedure, and then back up after the database so that if there's a need to recover from some point after the, the, uh, re the, the maintenance procedure is executed, you don't have to go back and repeat that procedure as part of the recovery. Whenever you initialize your journal files, it's always a nice idea to come through and have a, a, a solid quiesce point. So if you initialize the journals, make sure you back up all of your databases so that you're not having to, to go back to some other uh, uh, earlier copies of journals. The major thing here is uh, that's going to complicate your, your your recovery environment, uh, probably dealing with having to process those journals individually if you don't make that sync point because of the actual sequence numbers that are maintained within the journals. And then since automatic recovery is not available in local mode, anytime you're going to do some type of local mode updating, you want to make sure that you you back up the databases before and after the individual uh, local processing. Uh, if you have multiple jobs that run against the database and you back up at the start and you have some type of a failure, you're going to go back to that backup copy and then you may have to rerun all of the uh, local processing up to the point of the failure. Uh, so you may want to consider what is the cost of maybe backing up after each of the individual jobs depending on uh, the level of recovery uh, responsiveness that you want to have. And then that second major bullet, ensure that you can identify all archive files created between each standard backup. These uh, journal files are the, the, what you're actually going to use along with the backup files to bring the database up to uh, some point in time other than the actual backup. 
Some recoveries may be sufficient if you just use a backup. But let's say that you've been running for a week and you had a physical failure. You don't want to have to go through and, and rerun all of that data. You want to use your journal files to roll forward to the point of, from the backup to the point of the failure. So you'll need to know all of the archive files. So make sure that you, you know all of the archive files that are created and that they're retained along with the backup files. Now, we're going to talk a little bit here about the, uh, the IDMS utilities uh, used within the, the backup environment. And, and let me say here, before we get going, the, most sites do not use these utilities to actually back up the databases. And it is not required that you use these utilities. They will use, some sites will use an IEB Jenner just to copy the, the databases to uh, another file. Or they may use some other third party uh, product like an IBM backup or something of that nature. But we do supply uh, a backup and a restore utility for you. And so we're gonna touch on those very quickly here. Uh, a backup is a, a utility statement and it runs under the control of IDMS BCF. Your input parameters come in through the SysIPT DD statement and an output listing uh, comes out uh, to the SysList DD statement. The database is just read by the backup uh, utility. So it can be in a retrieval mode while the backup is running. And then we save those images off to another file, whether that be to a tape file or to some type of a disk file. And the, uh, the, the backup file goes to DD statement sys1. So the backup utility runs in a local mode. It does not go through the CV. Uh, so Again, you're going to want to make sure that, that each of these areas are in at least a retrieval mode uh, while the backup is running. It is recommended that you specify the file option rather than the area option when you're executing backup. When you get into a lot of your databases, your larger databases, they will actually be spread across, an area might be spread across multiple files. If you back up by area, then you must recover the entire area. But if you back up by file, and let's say you have a physical failure on one of the files, it is possible that you just restore that particular file and then do any type of roll forward, roll back operations against uh, that individual file to bring the whole area up. If you do it by area, then you have to process the whole area. However, if you have an area and uh, you have a file where you have uh, multiple areas defined on that uh, file, then the reverse recommendation is actually uh, the, the way to go. In that particular case, you would want to deal with a single area uh, or, or back up by a single area so that if you have some type of logical uh, outage, uh, bad data going into the, the, the area, and you need to go to a backup, then you can recover just that individual area and not all of the, the areas on that file. So uh, if, if you have an area or a file with multiple areas, use the area uh, option. Otherwise, use the, the file option within backup. Only one backup statement per job step is allowed. So if you have 10 files, you're going to have to run 10 individual job steps. And again, uh, there are IBM utilities, third-party products that uh, can be used and, and almost, uh, I would probably say almost all the sites use some other process than backup and, and restore. Backup and restore, I will admit, are not the fastest utilities in the world. So you can usually do your backup much faster using some type of IBM utility or some third-party product. As I've already mentioned, databases must be varied to retrieval or offline prior to starting the backup. And if backup is run against an area in update mode, hot backup procedures must be used when the backup file is restored. Uh, so again, at the, uh, the, one of the last things we'll be talking about are hot backups. So we'll, we'll leave this at this point. The restore utility uh, also is a utility statement that runs under the control of BCF. Input comes in through SysIPT, and SysList is our output listing. 
And now the input file into Restore is going to be the saved image file from the backup utility, and that is going to be used uh, to restore the information to the physical database. Restore must uh, have all of the areas and files that are being recovered offline from any CVs. In other words, no other copies of IDMS can be accessing that information. You don't want those in retrieval either because remember, you've got a bad database and you're restoring images. So, you know, you don't want people looking at that information. So, a couple points to remember when using Restore. If you backed up by area, you must restore by area. If you back up by file, you must restore by file. So the decision on how you're going to restore the database is going to be made back when you ran the backup utility, whether you use the area or the file options. If you use an IBM utility or some third-party product to back up the database, you must use that same utility or facility to recover the database. Okay, so again, restore only processes uh, backup files created by the backup utility. Now journals. Journals are what give you the greatest flexibility in recovering an IDMS database. All IDMS activity, all update activity is journaled, whether you're in local mode or central mode. Uh, the, the DBMS always goes through the motions of journaling. In many cases, sites will not journal during local processing, and what that means is that the journal files in the, in the batch jobs are dummied out. So the DBMS goes through the uh, actions of, of creating journal records and writing them, but when the write is actually occurred, the operating system realizes it's a dummied file and immediately returns control to the DBMS. So many sites will be using local mode uh, for performance reasons. So that is why many sites will dummy out the journals. But just so you are aware, it is possible to have sequential journals defined to local jobs and journals created. Your central version is going to have disk files defined to it. and and this is where you're always going to want to have your journals defined. Uh, so we're going to end up using these journals uh, for rolling back or rolling forward information to recover the databases necessary. Uh, journals created during the execution of a CV contain information about all of the jobs or all of the activities within that CV. This differs from the local mode environment. In local, a local job uh, just recover or just uh, journals the information about that particular job step. So it is going to be unique, the information there is going to be unique to that job step. But in CV, all of the activities, whether there are multiple databases, whether they're batch jobs, uh, something coming through server, CICS task, anything going through that CV will be journaled into one set of journals, and IDMS will use that for uh, the recovery activities. Again, typically these are written to disk files. Uh, I, I occasionally come across a site that's gone with sequential in very low volume uh, sites, but I would, I would never recommend that you do that. I would always recommend that you go with disk files. As these journal files are filled, IDMS will cycle to the next uh, disk journal file, and the full journal file must be archived to a sequential file when that file is full. We will then, as part of that archive process, free up the space so that as other journals fill, we can then go through and reuse that uh, previously filled journal. Uh, and it's these archive files that you're going to use in some of the manual recovery activities. Uh, these archive, the, these files that are archived, they're referred to as archived journals, and as I said, are used for the manual recovery operations. Journal files consist of many record types. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the basic ones right here, and the first we want to talk about are the data images. Every time IDMS goes through and 
updates a record. Updating could be anything. It could be modifying a record, storing a record, erasing a record, uh, connecting or disconnecting a record from a set. So anytime we go through and we, we update a record, IDMS will create on the journal file a before image and an after image of that record. So if you're going through, let's say you're doing a store, even though the record does not exist prior to the store, we will add a before image to the journal. There will be no data in that record. That is what's known as a null before image. Then at the completion of the store, we will go through and write an after image that contains, again, header information and the actual image of that particular record. Modifies, you'll get the data on both of those records, and an erase. If we go through and erase a record, the before image will have data. The after image will be a null after image. So we'll still get an after record, but there will be no data because the record has been removed from the database as a result of the erase. So, so these are going to be the bulk of the records that you're going to have on the journal, the before and after image of each update of records. There will also be a number of checkpoint records out there that are going to be common across the environment. And when you do a bind run unit, basically at that point, uh, you will generate something called a begin, a BGIN uh, checkpoint. That identifies to IDMS the beginning of a run unit or transaction on the journal. When you issue a finish command, and you're terminating the run unit, we will generate an end job, an NJ checkpoint. Again, this tells IDMS that we have a successful completion of a transaction. If your program issues commit commands, we will generate COMT checkpoints, commit checkpoints. The significance of a commit checkpoint is that IDMS will not recover if you're doing some type of an automatic recovery, it will not recover prior, anything prior to encountering a commit checkpoint. So that commit checkpoint is telling IDMS, at this point in time, I want you to make these updates permanent to the database. So let's say your program then subsequently uh, gets a SOC 7 or a SOC 4 or something of that nature, IDMS will do a recovery, but when it gets to a commit checkpoint, it will stop because you have told IDMS that these updates are now permanent uh, and basically cast in concrete. If it doesn't find any commit checkpoints, it will recover that run unit back to the begin checkpoint, the point where the transaction started. When a program or some type of failure occurs, we will also identify that fact by writing abort checkpoints, ABRT checkpoints to the journals. And again, these will be used in some of the recovery scenarios. So again, your, your, your bulk of your data is going to be your befores and afters. Your checkpoint records are going to be begin, end job, commit, and abort. There are many other checkpoints and types of records that could be written to the journals based on whether you're doing uh, transaction sharing, whether you're doing um, some type of uh, sysplex processing, things of that nature. But these are the basic checkpoints and data that you will typically see within a journal file. So let's take a look at an example of what is going on as we're actually doing some journaling. So. Uh, the first row of boxes represents the uh, program code, that the things that are actually being done by the program, and the lower level of boxes are going to give you an indication of what is going into the journal. So the first thing that the program does is it issues a bind run unit command. That goes through and in the journal causes a begin checkpoint to be written. The first command that DML command that is uh, encountered is a store. It's going to store record one. So IDMS will go into the journal, write a before image for record one. That will be a null before image. So there'll be no data in there, but you will still have a before record written. At the completion of the store operation, IDMS will write the after image for that record, and this will contain the actual data. 
The next command is an erase command. It's going to erase record 9, so you'll get a before for record 9. This will contain data for that, show the data uh, for that record at the beginning of the erase command. It will then, at the completion of the erase, generate an after image, and that would be a null after image because the record has been removed from the database. There's no data that would need to be restored, let's say if we're doing a roll forward, so it will be a null image. The program then issues a commit, so it tells IDMS anything prior to this is passed in concrete. It, it's, it's made permanent. So we write a commit record to the journal. We then do another store, so we get our null before and our after image for the before. And then finally, we end up uh, doing a finish command, and that causes the end job checkpoint to be written. Now, the writing of these records, uh, there is actually a journal buffer within IDMS, and that journal buffer is used to accumulate these various journal records. So when I say it writes a before image, really what it's doing is it's putting a before image into the journal buffer. Now, the journal buffer is written at the specific times or different times based on what is encountered by IDMS. For example, if the journal buffer becomes full, we then write that journal buffer and we move on to another journal buffer and start accumulating. So, so while that I.O. of the first journal buffer is going on, we're using the second journal buffer and, and there's no wait uh, by IDMS for that first journal buffer to be written. If a page containing an updated record occurrence has to be written back to the database, before we actually write the image of that record, of that update, to the database, we will write the block containing the before images, any before images for that record. We want to make sure that the before images are in the journal before we put data on the database so that if some type of recovery re, uh, operation is required, the journal accurately shows the updating of the database. And then finally, a database transaction, transaction is committed or backed out or terminates, uh, committed and uh, issuing the commit command or a finish. Uh, that all falls into the, the consideration of the, the word committed. Uh, but when that type of process occurs, we will write all of the journal blocks containing images for that particular transaction to the, um, uh, to the journal file um, before we actually do any of the final writes of data that still resides in the data buffers. So when the database, database pay, uh, buffer is full, we'll write it. it we will write the uh, journal buffer before we write any data records back to the database, and we will write the journal buffer any time we have finish or rollback or some type of, of uh, abort processing. Now, there are two types of recovery that you're going to encounter within an IDMS environment. An automatic recovery, and that is something that occurs within a central version, and as the name implies, it occurs automatically. The, there is no intervention from the DBA or operators or what have you. IDMS would detect some type of a, a, a failure and will go into a recovery mode. The other type is manual, and this is something where the DBA is typically going to become involved. Uh, manual recovery may be required if automatic recovery fails for some reason. Maybe you have an I.O. error on the journal file or uh, some, other, some other type of failure. If you have local mode update uh, processing, if it terminates abnormally, your batch job running locally fails, now your DBA has got to get into a manual recovery mode. If completed processing is determined to be incorrect, somebody comes through and says, oh, you know the, the regularly scheduled batch job from last night, from Friday night? Well, they, they ran with, with Wednesday's data, so the database is all screwed up. Okay, so that is something that's going to require a manual recovery. Or certainly any type of physical device failure, uh, crashes, uh, I.O. errors, things of that nature. So, looking at these various types of recovery, automatic recovery, again, is only available under the central version. 
this automatic recovery occurs uh, by when it uh, will automatically roll back a failing transaction. So if at some point in time uh, a program abends or there's some other type of, of uh, failure of that particular program, IDMS will detect that and will roll back that program's updates back to a commit checkpoint or to a begin checkpoint. If a program issues some version of the rollback command, this is a recovery that is, is basically being uh, directed to IDMS by the program, and at that point in time, IDMS will roll back all of the updates that have been performed to that program, uh, by that program, again, back to a commit or a begin checkpoint. In an SQL environment, uh, if you're dealing with some type of physical DDL statement, let's say you're going through and you're saying alter table, create schema, uh, or something of that nature, uh, any of those changes to the catalogs and to the dictionary areas uh, will be rolled back if there's some type of, of error encountered as part of that structure. And also, if you're dealing in an SQL environment, let's say that you're going through and you're, you're doing, say, an alter table where you're changing the characteristics of a table, which would also require the recovery of the data portion because there might have been some type of in-flight restructure going on. Uh, if it's done under the control of a CV, both the, the data and the, S, the uh, catalog activity will be automatically recovered as a result of that failing statement. And then finally, the, the granddaddy of them all, warm start. If for some reason the CV fails, whether the CV crashes or the machine crashes, what have you, IDMS can detect that information and will recover that CV uh, the next time that CV is brought up. So let's take a look at an example, uh, a little bit of a diagram example of automatic recovery. Uh, we're going to start with the database on the left, and for the purposes of our discussion, that database is going to contain records one and three. So the first transaction, transaction A starts, it does a bind run unit that causes the begin checkpoint to be written to the journal. It then goes through and does a store for record two. So we've added record two to our database uh, with this second the diagram here. Transaction A goes on and does some other type of processing. It could be waiting, who knows what it's doing. But in the interim, bind, uh, transaction B starts up, it does its own bind run unit, so it writes the begin checkpoint for that run unit to the journals. And then it goes through and issues an erase command. And that erases for record three. So this, the, the third uh, iteration of the database here, we see that we now have records one and two, and record three is gone. Now, transaction B goes off and does some other processing. Transaction A comes along, does a modify command to record A. We'll note that with the little, little M next to the one. And then it issues a finish. That would be causing an end job to occur on the database. Transaction B has been off doing some other type of processing, and then it starts processing, part of that processing results in an advent for whatever reason. IDMS is going to detect that that program has failed and will then go into a rollback mode. So let's take a look at the next image here, which is going to show us what we would, have, what we would expect to see on the journal. So we have our begin checkpoint for transaction A, are before and after for the store. The next thing that occurred while A was off doing some other processing was the uh, erase activity for, for three, record three. Transaction A then came through and not issued another uh, bind statement to modify record one and then did an end job. And then transaction B ab ended generating the abort record. IDMS comes along and starts reading this journal file and says, okay, I found transaction B, I've got an abort. It starts reading backwards through the journals. Well, this next record is for transaction A, ignore it. The after is for transaction A, ignore it. The for for A, ignore it. The next record is an after image for transaction B. So I now know I've got to do a recovery. And that recovery is to an erase command. 
So it goes back and it finds the before image for this record, and it puts record three back onto the database. It then goes down and finds a begin checkpoint and knows that its recovery is completed. So what I end up with is all of the updates performed by transaction A, the storing of record two and the modifying of record one are still in the database, but that erasure of record three, which was done by transaction B, our failing transaction, is placed back onto the database as if that erase had never occurred. Warm start is a version of this type of automatic recovery. If the CV crashes for some reason, whether it's due to a failure of the CV or just, uh, let's say, the operating system machine crashes, what have you, the next time IDMS starts up, it will go through and examine the journal files and determine the journal file that was being used when the previous version of IDMS failed. If it finds this type of failure, it then goes through and does a rollback of all of the outstanding run units that were active at the time of the failure. And it does basically what we just saw on the previous slide. It starts walking back, finds a pending or, or an active transaction, and rolls everything back for that, any of those transactions back to a commit checkpoint or to, be, or to a begin checkpoint. So during warm start, IDMS does the following. Establishes which this journal file was active at the time of the failure. It goes into that journal file, locates the last journal record before the system failed, and from that point on, starts reading backwards through that journal, looking for any transactions that are on the journal but had not been successfully terminated through an end job checkpoint uh, at the point in time that the ab end occurs. When it finds these transactions, as I said, it does the rollback of that transaction, it will then also go through and write an abort checkpoint to the journal for each of those outstanding transactions. So. I'm not going to try and walk us through this whole diagram. Uh, this is basically the same thing that we looked at with the automatic recovery. Just expanding this a little bit more from the standpoint of uh, multiple run units, uh, the, the, uh, the boxes with the arrows in the middle, those, those are our run units. Uh, and in the middle of the page with the before and after, those would be our journals. The basic thing here is that, again, when the system is restarting, we go through that journal looking for any of those run units that were active at the point in time that we had a failure, and then roll back that information back to a commit or a begin checkpoint, and then write abort checkpoints for all of the outstanding run units. Now, manual recovery. This is where the DBA is, becomes creative, where the DBA has got to do some analysis of what is actually occurring. So before you attempt any type of manual recovery, you want to gather some facts. First, the nature of the failure causing the need for a manual recovery. Did the system fail? Uh, maybe did warm start fail for some reason? Uh, do I have bad data? that's out on the database. You know, did I have uh, a failure in a journal file? Maybe my journal file's got an I.O. error or something. Somewhere along that line, what was the cause of that particular failure that you have to recover? You want to know the time of the failure. This is going to be the point in time that you're either going to roll things back from or possibly roll things forward to get a good database as close to that point of failure. Uh, so. So you want to know when the specific failure occurred. Uh, it may be very obvious. The CV crashed at such and such a time and warm start failed. Or it may be somebody ran bad data last night. So the, the, the time that you're looking for is the time before the bad job was run. Whether the failure occurred under the central version or in local mode, or if it spanned 
that environment because that is going to complicate uh, your recovery environment, the, the, re the presence of local mode processing. You can't just recover using journals. You can't roll back from some time at the, the present and roll back to a point where you've gone across local processing. That local processing must be dealt with specifically. What are the applications that were involved with the failure? If you're failure occurred or you have a problem with your order entry database, it may not require you to do any type of recovery to your employee database. So you want to know what were the applications that failed so you know what areas of the database were in use and, what er and, and therefore what areas must be recovered. Once you've gotten that information on the previous slide, you're going to want to go out and locate the, the backup and archive files that are appropriate for this, per, this type of recovery. So you want to locate the most recent backup of the database prior to the point of failure and then identify all of the archive journal files created since that backup. So that is going to allow me to either restore a backup and roll forward to the point of the failure, or just knowing that I have a failure, maybe I can just do a rollback from the point, but knowing the journal files that I'm going to need to do that recovery. Determine the points in time from which the recovery must start and finish. If journal files are going to be used, you're going to want to identify the begin, commit, end job, or abort checkpoints that encompass the start or end of the recovery operation. Basically, what that mouthful is saying is that you're going to want to go through and find the begin checkpoint closest to a recovery if you're going to do a rollback. So if you had some type of a failure or the, the, the data was bad, you'll want to do a rollback to the begin checkpoint prior to that failure. If it's, if it's date, bad data, let's say somebody ran a bad job uh, last night, the begin checkpoint that you're looking for would be the begin checkpoint of the bad job. And your manual rollback would go back to that begin checkpoint. If you had some type of, let's say, physical failure of, a, of, the, of, a, of the disk media, you will want to go through and restore a backup file and then do a roll forward. And what you're looking for there would be an end job checkpoint as close as possible to the point of failure uh, so that you can roll forward to that end job checkpoint and minimize the amount of data that would be lost. To be able to identify these checkpoints, you can use the print journal utility. Print journal. Uh, is a utility that is a utility statement. It runs under the control of BCF. Input and output parameters, as we've seen in all the other utilities, come through SysIPT Sys and SysList. And your, your archive journal files are the input into print journal. So here what you have is an example of some of the output uh, that, that you would expect from print journal. And basically what you're looking for, uh, where you see the, the line journal file contents, what you're going to be looking for are your begin and end job checkpoints. We only produce, uh, the, the print journal only gives you the information on checkpoints. We don't give you all of the, the before and after images. If you want to see those, there is a J report, J report 8 that is available uh, and that can create uh, a lot of data. I mean, because it's going to have all of the images of all of the records that were, that were modified. But for the purposes of recovery, what you're going to be interested in is going to be the begin and end job checkpoints. And so you're going to be looking for <clears throat> an appropriate end or begin job checkpoint and then looking at the date timestamps over here on the right to determine uh, what type of uh, or what the time was for that particular checkpoint and how it relates to your recovery environment. Uh, also, if you deal with end job checkpoints, commits, or, or aborts, there are also statistics out there, and that will give you statistical information about what that run unit actually did. Uh, that may be 
helpful to you at some point in time to determine, do I really need to recover this? Because maybe it, it, you did a commit and it was an update run unit, but it really didn't do anything. So you might not have to deal at that up to that particular point. But again, this is going to be a good report to come through and determine whether or not you, or which of the begin or end job checkpoints are going to be involved within your manual recovery. So during your manual recovery, you want to minimize the scope of that recovery. And you can do that, one, by only dealing with the areas or files that were impacted by the failure. If you have a CV and the only, you know, in your heart, you know, you can prove that the only thing that was being updated at that point in time was the order entry file because it was in the middle of the night and nothing else was processing but maybe batch jobs through the CV for order entry. Then all you need to do is deal with those areas and files that make up order entry. You don't have to deal with the employee database or human resources or, or say your manufacturing databases. So you limit just to those areas that are, are, that are involved with the failure. You may be able to, uh, depending on the nature of the failure, restrict your recovery to an individual file. You may have had a physical I.O. error on a file and that, that you've got to move that file to someplace else. And that file may, be made, may make up one very large area. Instead of having to deal with the entire area, you could recover that individual file and only do the recovery to that file and bring it up to a point with the rest of the area. So that could be very, uh, require very much less time to do that than having to process this large uh, area. Areas that were available for retrieval do not have to be recovered. Uh, that would uh, more or less be something in terms of probably your CV if you had a warm start failure, let's say. And if the recovery is due to an application error, all areas updated, updated by the application need to be recovered to ensure the logical integrity of the database. What we're getting at here is looking at the scenario where you say, oh, this program was updating the accounts receivable area. So I have to recover accounts receivable. But there might be other areas that have pointers into the accounts receivable area. And those pointers may have been updated as a result of activity against records in the accounts receivable area. So you want to make sure that those other areas that have those cross area pointers are included within your recovery environment. So uh, it, without dealing with those other areas, the logical integrity of that database may not be properly restored. Then determine the process to accomplish the recovery in the shortest length of time. So here is where we're going to try and make a decision. Do we want to maybe do a rollback or do we want to do a roll forward? Let's say that you come through and you take, you take your backups uh, on a weekly basis. Maybe Sunday night at midnight you, you take your backups. And now I have some type of, of failure of, of a program. Let's say maybe I've got that bad data scenario that, that I've mentioned before. And that bad data was run on Thursday. Well, I've got two options. I can restore the database back to the backup from Sunday, and then I can do a roll forward of, through that database using all of the journals from Sunday night through the, the bad update on Thursday. It's a lot of journals to process. But maybe instead I can use my journal files and with the, the position of the database or the condition of the database that it is at now, I can use my, my journal files since the bad program was run and I can do a rollback. And that might only be one hour, 10 hours, 12 hours worth of journals as opposed to multiple days. So that recovery is going to take less time. So the, you're going to make that decision uh, whether or not I'm better starting at the point that the database exists at and do a rollback, or am I better off restoring some type of a backup file and then doing a roll forward 
to the point of the failure. I'll tell you, this is where you're going to shine as a DBA because when this type of thing occurs, you can count on the fact that everybody's going to be looking at you because your database is down. So the, the shorter the time that it's going to take to do recovery, the better you're going to look to your organization. So you want to make sure that you, you come up with a, a recovery strategy that is going to minimize the amount of time that is going to be necessary. Okay. The rollback utility, uh, we've been talking about rollback and roll forward. The rollback utility is run under is, is a utility statement. It's run under the control of IDMS BCF. Uh, input parameters and output come through SysIPT and SysList. Your input is going to be your archived journal files, and the output is going to be the database. You'll notice on here that we also have some optional sort work, and we're going to be talking about a feature of the rollback and the roll forward utilities that talks about sorting. And if you do use the sort options, you will need some type of sort work uh, data sets. The rollback utility typically starts with the current state of the database. So somebody came through and says, I've got a failure or somebody ran the bad data, so right now the database that exists out there uh, is bad and I need to recover backwards in time to some point before that bad job. So rollback goes through and uses the before images on the database and restores progressively earlier stages of the, of the files or areas back to the, the starting begin checkpoint that you're going to be dealing with. Now, the rollback utility can be run in two modes, sequentially, and that applies before images in a reverse order. That implies that we're reading the files backwards. Disk files typically cannot be read backwards, or they can't be read backwards. Not typically, they can't be read backwards. So, but tape files can be read in a backward mode. So if you're dealing with sequential processing and you have tape, or tape files, we will position ourselves at the end of the tape file and read backwards applying all of the four images. We'll talk about recovery with disk files in just a second here. But that sequential process, I should point out, that's like the same thing with your application program, adding individual or doing individual updates to the database. You're going to get a record, restore it, read a record, restore it, read a record, restore it. If you have five hours worth of updating, that sequential process may take close to five hours to, to process. You can use an option within the rollback utility called sorted. And if you run with the sorted option, IDMS will go through, the rollback utility will go through, read the journal files in a forward uh, direction, will sort that information, and will only apply the last or, or the, the earliest before image for a given record. So if a record is updated five times, instead of applying five images, the only image that you're going to apply is the earliest before image for that particular record. Recoveries that run sequentially and can run many hours running sorted will run much shorter. So it is strongly recommended if you're doing some type of a rollback that you use sorted. It will reduce the recovery time significantly. Now, if you have multiple journal files, that may mean multiple archive files. You must consolidate them in the order in which they were created into a single file and then use that as your input into the rollback utility. If the journal file is on disk, certainly we cannot read it backwards. So we have come up with a uh, get around process for you to be able to do that. And in this particular case, what you will do is in the sys IDMS parameters, you will specify the roll or the specify the parameter rollback 3490. Now what that does is it tells the rollback utility to simulate rollback processing. So 
what you then must also do is take your journal files that you've consolidated into a single journal file, as we pointed in the last bullet on the other, the previous slide. We want to come through, take that file and sort it using the parameters that you see here. Sort fields equal 13 comma 16 comma binary comma descending. And what that will do is create a disk file in the backwards, in a backwards sequence. So the rollback 3490 is telling rollback that what it's going to really do is encounter a journal file that is already in a reverse sequence. So then we can go through and uh, process that as if we were reading the file backwards. You can still use this uh, if you use the sorted, but uh, sorted does not typically require the, the rollback 3490. It will read in a forward, mo in, in a forward way and then uh, only apply the, the appropriate images after it does its internal sort. And that is where you're going to actually need your sort work. Okay, well, we've gotten to the top of the hour and I think we've probably got ourselves a good half an hour, 40 minutes or so uh, to finish up the rest of this. So I think it's probably appropriate for us to stop here, take questions, and then next week we'll have our seventh session and we'll finish talking about roll forward and we'll get into the hot backup topics. So Len, if you'd like to take any questions now at this point in time, we can, uh, we can deal with those. Thanks, Dick. Much appreciated. So yeah, so folks, if you uh, have any questions, please use the Q&A box. We do have a couple minutes left. Um, I don't see anybody who's on the phone line, but just in case I'm missing somebody, um, you can also hit pound six to unmute your line to ask any questions. We do only have a couple minutes, so if, if any questions come in that we don't have time to answer, um, I'll make sure Dick gets a copy of them and we'll, uh, we'll follow up separately or we can address them next week. All right, I don't see any questions coming in, so we can go ahead and wrap up for this week. Um, Dick, thanks as always, and also to those of you who joined us. We appreciate you taking the time on a Friday morning to join us, so uh, we'll see you next time for the seventh and final uh, webcast in this series. So t have a great weekend, everybody.